instant that one realizes that you're having a genuinely new thought is in, essentially indescribable. I'm sure that this is something similar to what people describe as a muse. It seems unworldly. I had a little telescope I'd take up country and everybody in the village would come out and they'd look through the telescope and see the craters in the moon or the rings of Saturn. and They'd go ooh and ah, just like my family and friends back in Michigan do. And it finally hit me, this is what makes us human. This ability to look at the sky with wonder. I look through a microscope, I can't help but be struck with a sense of awe and wonder about what I'm looking at. And I can't help but reflect on the larger questions of life. The human spirit does uh, gain a lift from pure curiosity, trying to understand who we are and where we fit into the larger scheme of things. Because if we didn't have that sense of awe, if we didn't have that sense of curiosity, we wouldn't start down this road in the first place. It's hard to do world-class science. When you look into something, you almost always get a surprise. And then that surprise leads you into new pathways. Are there failures? Absolutely. When you don't have very firm grounds, you're really searching for a needle in a haystack. I collected a lot of hay before I found that needle. It sure is fun to play in this space and to make new discoveries and hopefully make contributions that move us forward. Science loves problems. Any fool can find the solution. <laughs> it takes a genius to find the question. We live in a world loaded with questions and puzzles. If you know how to look, you can begin to see connections on humans and other species and between humans, other species, and the planet itself. And when you see those connections, it's hard not to be in awe. Uh, that uh, kinship that human beings share with all other creatures on Earth is a very, very powerful thing and helps us to understand the continuities and to place into context our uniqueness. So we get into those philosophical questions of what is life? And within that context, what is it to be human? There's this incredible universe that surrounds the Earth for us to go and explore and that we as humans have to pick up that charge. And then it becomes the task of human societies, cultures, and religious communities and philosophers to dig deep and find out what, what that message is that's beyond just what science is telling us. Um, so I want to talk a bit about how science, exploration, and inspiration fit together and also express how science is integral to every part of our lives today. So even if you're not a scientist, you have no intention of being a scientist, your field of expertise this seems totally uh, disjoint from what you might think of as science, it's not true. Everything we're doing, everything we do and live and breathe in modern society is impacted by science and technology. And if we are going to understand any kind of human venture, any kind of mission, anything that, that we feel is valuable, we need to understand the promise and the challenges of today's science and technology. Um, but... I also think we can be inspired by what we're discovering with astronomy in general. So um, here is an image of a region in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, it's an image that shows the vibrancy of star formation. This is my own expertise area, which is that stars are continuing to form out of interstellar clouds. And we have lots of different telescopes that are watching and studying this process. So here's a region where we see bright, a uh, beautiful cluster of stars and the surrounding gas 
uh, that is kind of their stellar nursery. And the, the light from these big bright stars actually ionizes the surrounding gas um, out of which they formed, and it creates this beautiful, colorful nebula. And so when we see these regions, we can see a lot of activity and we see a lot of beauty. And I think that's part of inspiration. Um, my, uh, my other hat is that I am an astronomer and I work, I've worked with several different uh, facilities, major astronomy facilities over the years. I've worked with radio telescopes, infrared telescopes, all kinds of telescopes, but I didn't grow up uh, thinking that I would be a scientist or even knowing what a scientist was, all right? I grew up here <laughs> on a farm in north central Arkansas, not too far away from where <laughs> Dr. Keith Lee grew up exactly. So, um, so, uh, and so this is a winter day on our family cattle farm, and I'm the one in the middle there. <laughs> so, um, it's a cold day, and I didn't, we weren't even near a university or anything like that, but we, I loved nature. So I think growing up in the outdoors helped me to really appreciate all parts of the natural world. I love animals. I love forests, plants. I love just wandering around. Um, and we had lakes to play in and clean rivers and, 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 the, and we had a night sky. And a lot of people are missing the night sky these days because of light pollution but I was able to go out with my family at night and just kind of look up and wonder what was out there. And, and during my growing up years was the first time we were getting images in from NASA probes that were going into the outer solar system and sending back the first images of the moons of planets like Jupiter and Saturn. I was just fascinated by these pictures of other worlds. I watched the Cosmos program every week on PBS. And, and I, want, I, would, I wanted to explore those worlds to be part of this enterprise. I didn't know how, but I knew that I loved this idea of, of exploring the natural world. Well, thankfully and providentially, the doors opened for me over the years to study science. I majored in physics, then studied astronomy and graduate work. And now uh, I'm involved in the astronomy world where we use all kinds of different tools for our studies and exploration. So, so we use telescopes in space. That's the image on the top is an example of a space telescope. That is the Hubble Space Telescope. It's operating very well right now. It's orbiting around the Earth very quickly. In fact, during the time of our luncheon, it will have gone all the way around the Earth in one full orbit, every about every 90 minutes or so. But it's above the atmosphere, as you can see below it, in order to get clearer images. So it, it doesn't, when light comes through our atmosphere, it can become distorted, it, some of it's filtered out. So if you can get a telescope very high, you get much crisper images. But we also need other kinds of telescopes because they all have different skilled, if you will. So there's an example of telescopes on the ground on the lower left, the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, and on the lower right, radio telescopes in South America. We use all of these kinds of facilities to give us a, a fuller picture of what we're studying. Um, and it's technology that's enabled us to do this, right? So here's an example where hand in hand, we have engineering and technology being used for scientific discovery, which in turn, I believe, is blessing the world. So technology can be used for good things or bad things, but here's a case where I think technology has been used for good things, and we've, in, we've needed hands-on human continuing interaction with at least the, space, the Hubble Space Telescope, with astronauts returning time and again to upgrade the telescope, um, repair things, put in new instruments, um, here's some pictures from the dramatic uh, last Hubble servicing mission, which happened in 2009. The telescope is still in ter terrific shape, by the way. But during that last servicing mission, um, one of the astronauts brought with him this. So this is the space shuttle. They went up on the space shuttle to do their work on, on the, t the space telescope. So this is the cockpit of the space shuttle. Looking out the window at the top, you can see the Hubble telescope, which for those few days was kind of um, uh, anchored there in the back of the space shuttle for their servicing work. And inside the shuttle, the astronauts would, um, would hang out in this pressurized environment. And that thing in front is a model of Galileo's telescope. 
So here you have juxtaposed in this image a telescope from 400 years ago that kind of the technology started opening our eyes to a universe that had before been unseen. And the rapid progress of technology over the last four centuries, and especially the last few decades, so that we now have these telescopes that are opening our eyes to things Galileo couldn't even imagine, hundreds of billions of galaxies, these kinds of things. So technology, science, curiosity, hand in hand, can open our eyes to things that I think can then fertilize theology, art, music, um, philosophy, uh, and there is a, a great beauty. So here's another one of these images enabled by the Space Telescope of stars and very um, uh, turbulent gas lit up, heralding activity and beauty in our own galaxy. So we live in an incredible universe that inspires wonder and awe, I believe. And I'm going to uh, hurry us through our wonder and awe real quick because we, I, um, cause we've got only about 15 minutes left here. But here's, here's an example uh, for, my, for my remarks. Um, here's an example of an image of stars. I'll say more about this tonight if you come. Uh, again, enabled by a telescope that gives us sharper resolution than we could get with most telescopes on the ground. So we can differentiate star from star within this very dense cluster called Omega uh, Centauri. But if you want to understand the context of this image, you need to use a different kind of telescope, which gives you a broader field of view. So here's a, a, an image from a telescope on the ground that sees a wide field of view toward the center of our galaxy. You see a lot of dust down there in the bottom of that image and a lot of bright stars and objects that look like stars. But in fact, um, they're not all stars. Uh, some of them are bright clusters of stars. And so here, we're going to zoom in on this image to one of these objects that you thought was a star, but we're going to transition to other telescopes that can see more detail. And you see it's actually a cluster. And now we transition over to the Hubble image that shows you that cluster that we started with. So you see context matters. And different kinds of telescopes give you different fields of view, different perspectives. And that's true with all kinds of science instruments, and I think there's kind of a spiritual parallel, too. When you uh, um, look with different eyes, you see different perspectives of the same reality. All right, if you come tonight, you'll get to see that again. All right. All right, and again, this is the beautiful Orion Nebula, what I studied from my own doctoral work uh, of continuing star formation in this beautiful uh, region called Orion. Um, all of these uh, clouds of gas and dust uh, fill the volume, for the most part, of what we call galaxies, which also contain hundreds of billions of stars. So here's an example of a beautiful spiral galaxy uh, that we think looks somewhat similar to our own, but we can't get all the way out of our own to take a selfie. So we have to kind of look around from inside, and we think that ours is a spiral galaxy. There's so many stars in here that the light just all blends together in the background, and you can see some background galaxies in this image as well. Um, it's so beautiful that astronomers named this one NGC 1309. <laughs> All right, just, um, <laughs> and so with that inspiration, um, I like this quote from, from uh, Kant, uh, uh, translated here to say two things filled his mind with ever-increasing wonder and awe. What are those two things? the more often and more intensely he reflected on them. Those two things were the starry heavens above him and the moral law within him, all right? And so isn't that incredible? I think still today, society in general is intrigued by the universe and what we're learning about cosmology and our origins and our future um, and justice issues, the moral issues. Who gets to decide what's right and wrong? How do we decide as a, as a culture and as a society? So those two realms of things are still of great interest uh, to people today. All right, so new technologies are enabling new scientific discoveries and advances. Um, and they also open up new questions or bring new depth to old questions. 
And so whatever line of work or expertise you are in or pursuing, I want you to understand that science is relevant to your life. And I want to just throw out some examples here. So we're not going to go into any depth on this, but I just want to show you some of the breadth of, of, of ways in which science relates to uh, culture, to ethics, to faith. Um, and here we go. All right. So they also affect how we view ourselves, who we are as human beings. One of them, we'll start with astronomy, since that's my favorite field. Um, we're discovering a lot of planets these days outside our solar system. Did you know that? So these are called exoplanets, planets outside of our solar system. So we know the planets, like the one we're on, that are orbiting our sun, but we didn't know, we thought there would be, but we didn't know for sure that there were planets orbiting other stars. And still, until just the last two or three decades, um, telescope technology has gotten more sophisticated. We're starting to discover these things. We've discovered thousands of them now. We can do the statistics now, and we realize that most stars seem to have at least one planet. So that's changed everything. Now we're, now we're in a big rush to find out if there are other planets like Earth out there, and we need better and better telescopes to really get into the details of what these planets are like. But that refertilizes an age-old question. Could there be life beyond Earth? And that question is a scientific question, but it also is a, it begs all these philosophical and theological questions. Um, even the ancient Greeks were thinking about this, all right? So if you come tonight, we'll talk about this a little bit more. It uh, begs questions of significance. If we're not the only life, what is or is not the significance of human life? Um, and so thinking about that is something that's being refertilized by this whole science of exoplanets. Um, there's an artist's conception, for example, of a very real planetary system that was discovered with the Kepler Space Telescope. In this case, a star with with uh, six planets in, in a tight orbit around that star um, discovered indirectly. We'll talk more about that this evening. Hope you show up. Okay, next topic, um, the human microbiome. Your body, the one you're sitting in right now, actually contains trillions of microbiota cohabiting within you. And, and the estimates vary, but there's something, there's at least the number, there's at least one, maybe 10 times the number of cells in your body without your DNA as there are cells with your DNA. So you are actually a little walking community with all kinds of little organisms in you that you need. Did you know that? Okay. So, um, so that, that has both practical and philosophical implications. Uh, um, Philosophically, the question is, well, are you one or are you many? Am I one person or am I a community, a biological community? I couldn't actually exist without these other creatures within me. Um, and it, it makes a difference in terms of health care and nutrition and what we understand about working with people in different cultures and different kinds of, of environments around the world. Their microbiome is affected by their environment. The microbiome infects, affects your whole sense of well-being. There's lots of interesting things about this microbiome, uh, both philosophically and practically speaking. Another topic, the, hu the, the uh, human-machine interface is blurring. Um, what's the difference between you and a machine, that used to be obvious, now it isn't. Um, walk around, everybody's staring at their phones. Uh, we're implanting things even in people's bodies, uh, sometimes to enhance them. And this is going to grow more and more into our uh, societal reality uh, uh, coming soon. And so we, we, we need to be thinking about this. Artificial intelligence um, is big. You know this already. but um, it affects what we think about in terms of faith and practice as well. And this is a website I found uh, with a lot of interesting articles about this topical area. You already know that cars are being programmed to drive themselves. And it's not working out perfectly well just yet, right? Um, but then, you know, everything that we that is artificial intelligence or machines or computers, well... It's being birthed through human thought and ingenuity. So human brilliance is going into these things, but human 
fallibility and even unconscious prejudices and biases are going into these things as well. So there's a lot of discussion about is artificial intelligence really objective? It can't really be because it's being created by humans. And it's a very interesting area. Um, we also have to program machines to make moral choices, you know, so there, there's always these, these age-old dilemmas of, you know, if, if you could swerve to hit, uh, swerve to miss hitting one person, but you knew if you did that, you might hit a whole bunch more, or if you swerved to miss a group of people knowing that you would hit one person and kill them, uh, you know, what's the right moral choice? Ah, you know, and how do you program that into a car? So, so the things like that are, 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 uh, are right with us now. Um, neuroscience, um, lots of interesting topics coming up. Um, for one, uh, how do you know when you're really dead, okay? Um, we, we, we finally, I think, came to a societal con uh, um, consensus, more or less, that when your brain ceases to function, then that's, that's when you're dead. But recently, apparently, and this is not my field, so I apologize to those of you who know more about this than I, but at least a pig brain that was brain dead, supposedly, was, was revived, um, so, wait a minute. So maybe when you we thought you were dead, maybe you're not really dead. Maybe you can be revived and this this is just refertilizing all these questions about what does it mean to be alive or dead? What is consciousness? You know, what is what does it mean to be conscious? What's the difference between the brain and the mind? And how does that relate to consciousness? So these are all hot topics. What about our environment? We know that our earth is changing. Tomorrow's earth is going to be different than today's earth. What are we doing now with technology and with our policy choices to affect how the earth is going to be tomorrow? And if the earth is going to change, how are we preparing for that um, in terms of caring for the world's people, the world's life? Um, neuroscience, big questions. Am I only my brain? If I understand how my brain works, is that everything about me? Are all my choices dictated by my brain? Genetics, am I only my genes? Um, is everything about me dictated by my genetic makeup? So that, and then if so, am I responsible for my choices if everything about me is dictated by my genes or my brain? Um, and then, of course, now we can actually edit genes, right? So we have this CRISPR technology, which is greatly wonderful, promise, promising technology for perhaps sparing people from miserable diseases. Um, and, and physical problems, um, but also ethically challenging as well. Should you really be changing people's genetic code, particularly if it's a change that can be passed down the, the line to future generations? Um, there's a lot of discussion about this. There was uh, some recent cases of gene editing that made the, the news where scientists felt they were doing something good to edit the genes of of uh, babies, uh, uh, embryos, babies that were born um, genetically altered to pr help them to be resistant to HIV. Isn't that a wonderful thing to do? Um, well, not according to Francis Collins, a head of the NIH and an outspoken Christian as well. And he said this was an epic scientific misadventure, pro profoundly unfortunate, ill-considered, flouted international norms, unconvincing justifications. So we have yet to come to a global consensus on what kinds of technology that has good, promising good uses should be used and what kinds we need discussion and who gets to make those decisions, right? Who gets to make the ethical choices about what we use and what if some countries agree and some don't? So there's a lot of, of uh, issues of where science and technology holds promise but needs to be discussed within a larger context of human values. And then, of course, we'll return to my favorite theme, the universe. Uh, we are discovering through more sensitive telescopes that are like time machines, which I'll talk a bit more about tonight, but that we can actually see that our whole universe is changing over time. How exciting is that? But that kind of gives us deeper questions of where have we come from, where are we going uh, in our planet and if that wasn't enough, um, here's a whole hodgepodge of questions that where science, technology, values, religion touch each other. Um, 
I'm going to just let you glance through these quickly. Um, purpose. What's the purpose of the universe? That's a philosophical question, but it's begged by science. Um, what does it mean to be human? What does science tell me about being human? And what do religious texts tell me about being human? And what, how does that fit together? And how do we relate to the other animal world? What do we know about human origins? What about neuroscience? Um, is there such a thing as a science of prayer? Do my thoughts determine my actions? Or are my actions actually shaping and determining my thoughts? That's a really interesting topic as well. Can theology and science come to complementary conclusions? All right, so today's challenges and opportunities are interconnected more than ever before. Um, so, for example, studies of the brain and behavior involve science, but they, they spill over into uh, issues with health and the law. Um, artificial intelligence involves education, law, business, technology. Space exploration involves engineering, science, law, business, policy, education, and I should have put on their international relations. Environmental challenges also involve international relations, but uh, science, policy, business, education, law. Business has international scope and impact financially and environmentally, so we have an interconnected world now where all of these things are relating to one another. We can't <coughs> stovepipe science and technology as different from business or the environment, or our international relations. Um, and I think I will just give you a little teaser about my universe. Uh, this, is a, this is the deep feel, one of my favorite images from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is uh, a view of space taken with the telescope looking in a direction of the sky where there aren't very many nearby stars to kind of drown out the image, and just collecting light for many days to see what faint things would show up. And this was the result. <coughs> This is a little small area of the sky, but you see thousands of little smudges of light in here. These are not stars. These are other galaxies. So each one of these little smudges of light has billions of stars. And if you imagine this extrapolated over the whole sky, that's the universe that we live in. Our Milky Way would be just like one of these little smudges of light if we could get far enough out to look back. So that, every time I see that image, it just kind of blows me away. Well, our telescopes have enabled this, us to see this. So if you just imagine, you know, a century ago, we didn't even know there were other galaxies. Now we know the universe is populated by galaxies. And not only that, but these galaxies that we're seeing, um, some of them are greater distances than others. So it's taken longer for the light to get to us from some of these galaxies than others. And we can... It's difficult work, but you can piece together the distances of these various galaxies and kind of line them up by their distance, and you can actually see that galaxies are not the same. The more distant galaxies are smaller. Um, they have yet to have had generations of stars come and go. Over time, they merge, they grow, and they have time to form these rotational structures like spiral structures, and uh, such as we have in our own Milky Way. So we can actually see that the universe has become... Uh, more friendly to life over time uh, through these generations of stars. And, and so um, does that indicate purpose? And that leaps to a philosophical question. We'll get to this tonight. Does the universe have a purpose? All right. Um, and I'm just going to skip to this here. I think I like what Sir John Polkinghorne, who's a physicist who became an Anglican priest, said. He said, science and theology are both concerned with the search for truth. I like that. He said, in consequence, they complement each other rather than contrast one another. Of course, the two disciplines focus on different dimensions of truth, but they do share a common conviction that there is truth to be sought. So I like this idea of different kinds of truth. You use different kinds of tools to address different kinds of questions. I think this is where a lot of us in the science and faith dialogue get into trouble sometimes if we try to use a theological tool to answer a scientific kind of question, or we try to use a science tool to answer a theological type of question. It's not that these things are unrelated to each other. You just need to kind of use the right tool to address the right kind of question. And I'm a scientist. I love science. But science isn't the right tool to answer all kinds of questions. Um, and uh, neither is the Bible, I should say, in my belief, the right kind of tool that's not the purpose of Scripture to answer detailed questions 
that I believe God has given us the gift of science to help us understand the details of certain things. So, um, yeah, so I think I just said all this. Uh, can science and religion both address truth? And how does a biblical view of the cosmos relate to a scientific view? I think as we get into those kind of conversations, it's helpful to remember that science is limited to addressing certain kinds of questions of how and when and why physical cause and effect, while our faith better addresses questions like why, capital W, and is there a God, and how should we live, and how should we use this knowledge and this technology? And of course, I'll cite for you my favorite psalm, um, Psalm 19, just to re remember that um, in Scripture, when nature, in particular when the heavens are mentioned, it's most often in the context of praise, which I think is kind of the greatest starting point for all of this. And so Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. And yet they have no speech. They're not using words. No sound is coming from them. And yet somehow their voice goes into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. And I think that's still going on. And then as, uh, and from a personal perspective here as a Christian, I think we can go a little deeper than that because we understand this concept that blows my mind of the incarnation, that the God responsible for the universe that we have awe about and the natural world that we study with science um, is not disconnected from, from the God we love and in fact is intimately physically connected. And um, Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. So there is good purpose for all of this. All right, let me move um, to our response, and then we'll have some conversation. So how do we respond to this amazing universe? How should we respond? Well, I would say the first response is to give praise. When we hear some new scientific discovery, when we think about things on the grand scale or on the small scale, um, we, we can and should feel a sense of humility and awe, hopefully curiosity. Um, I think then we can move to a sense of stewardship. What do we do with this knowledge? Well, we, we care for our planet and all of its inhabitants, human and non-human, as good stewards we should be. And I think continuing to explore and learn and yes, there are some troubling questions, but, you know, that's okay. We need to be discussing these things and considering them together, all in a spirit of humility, love, faith, and assurance that all of these things are, are uh, under divine knowledge. We explore and learn. I think that that uh, glorifies God. Let me just say that I think the universe inspires. And uh, with that, I think... Um, uh, we should be inspired to care for our home planet as part of this universe. Um, this is a view from the space shuttle looking back at planet Earth after one of these servicing missions of the space telescope, and you see the sun rising above the limb of the Earth in the background there, and you see this tiny little bright light. That's the atmosphere around our planet, all right? It's beautiful, it's fragile. So at the very least, what we learn from science should help us to take care of this beautiful, wonderful planet that we live on. Um, I have some examples of resources here that I think are useful in this whole discussion of interaction between science, faith, ethics, um, religion, technology, and uh, I hope you can take a picture of this and use some of this in your own realm of work. I think I'll stop there and we can have conversation. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, we have a couple of uh, microphones, so as you ask your question, raise your hand and we'll get the microphone to you so that the question can be recorded also. Um, as you're thinking about your question, I have a couple of questions. One of them is practical and the other is geeky. Uh, which one would you rather have first? Uh, geeky. Geeky, okay. okay. <laughs> so um, what is the thing about Beetlejuice? Is it about to explode? So, does anybody know what he's talking about? Okay, tell them, tell them what is Beetlejuice, not the movie. Uh, tell them about Beetlejuice and what's going on. Okay, so, so um, there's, a, there's a region of the sky known as Orion. I hope you are all familiar with this constellation. 
which sometimes I show, um, I, I, um, I, the, the constellation is supposed to be a hunter, and I, I show that constellation, but I've never really liked that imagery because when I was growing up and looking at the sky, I imagined this constellation as a kite with a kite face and a kite tail. And it turns out that indigenous Americans, Native Americans, some, some uh, cultures in indigenous America called that region of the sky the winter maker because it shows up in the winter. I love that idea of the winter maker. But one of the primary stars in this constellation is a reddish star up toward the top. In North America, it looks kind of upper left. Um, um, and it's called Betelgeuse, and it's a red giant star. And we know that red giant stars are old stars that are becoming unstable. And so they're kind of running out of their inner fuel, and eventually they will um, uh, explode as a supernova explosion. Well, over the past few weeks, maybe months, it's been noticed that Betelgeuse is getting notably dimmer, 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 dimmer. Um, in the sky, I mean, you can tell that yourself if you're an at with your bare eyes. If you if you're paying attention, over the last year, that star has become less bright. So people are getting excited. Maybe this is the time that this star is about to to blow, and which would be really exciting. It's not dangerous for us. It's far enough away, but it would be really neat to see something that close uh, light up the night sky. But um, it turns out that Betelgeuse, while it could blow any day uh, over the next million years, something like that, <laughs> it's, it is a variable star anyway. It already has brightness variations, and it may be that this is... Uh, and it has brightness variations compounded at different frequencies, and sometimes they kind of line up where a variation of a slower frequency lines up with a variation that it has at a faster de uh, frequency so that it's basically double dim for a short amount of time. So this may be just kind of its natural variations. And so astronomers aren't getting too riled up about this, but it is interesting to note. So this. how often in human history does uh, do stars go supernova? Um, and like when was the last one? And if it occurred, I mean, I've heard people say, that it would be as bright as the moon, that it would be like seeing almost two suns. Is that, is that what we would see? I think so. I, I'd have to look up to see exactly how bright it would be, but it would be very bright. You would not miss it, and it would be really exciting. So we think a supernova, depending on the type of galaxy, but it happens about um, once every 100 years in any particular galaxy kind of thing. And so it's been a while since we, the, the, the nearest to us in time supernova, time and space, I should say, supernova that's been exciting has been supernova 1987A, which took place in, we have a little sister galaxy real close to the Milky Way called, well, two of them called the Magellanic Clouds. And this supernova went off um, in 1987 in one of those real nearby sister galaxies. And it's very exciting. We're still watching the debris from that supernova. Why does this matter? Well, we think that this, you know, stars are actually doing, they're not just shining for no reason. They're actually uh, forging new atoms, new heavier atoms in the cores of these stars uh, as this fusion process goes on that creates light, but it also creates heavier elements. And when a star explodes, it disperses that material. So these are like little factories. And so it's really quite exciting to see how, the unit, how galaxies are enriched by materials produced in stars when they explode in this way. So that's what we, uh, we, it would be really neat if a star that close exploded to us because it wouldn't be dangerous, but it would be both fantastic in the sky, but it would also um, be very educational because we could study the details of a supernova. My understanding is, is the last one that humans could see was like the 17th century or something like that? You mean unaided? I unaided, mean, yeah, um, naked eye. Yeah, I would have to look that up, but it's been a while, yeah. Like I said, I could geek out on this. Well, yeah, this I'll take you to one, one, <laughs> one geeky step further, which is that we use supernovae all the time for another reason. And these most distant galaxies um, in that deep field, for example, when we're looking deep into the universe, um, we can't see individual stars in these very distant galaxies. It, they're just too far away. 
But if we want to know the distance of those galaxies, we need to be able to see individual stars. And the only way we can see an individual star is if it explodes. So we look, we're constantly panning the, the, the deep universe for a super, supernovae explosions in other galaxies. And that gives us a hint based on the brightness of that explosion as to how far away that galaxy is in which the star sits. So we use supernovae to help us gauge distances to distant galaxies. Now my practical question. Okay. Uh, most of the, your, your listeners, uh, your hearers today, are those who are preparing for some type of vocational ministry. Um, how would you, what advice would you give us as to how best to minister to those who are involved in the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math? Uh, say that you have young people who are hoping to go into the field, or you have those in your church who are already engaged in that. How, how best can we minister to those in a way that would be um, sensitive to, to, to their life experiences? Um, I would say, um, first of all, present science and, and technology as a good thing, you know, something that is, can be used um, to bless others. So, so, so it's, it's a good thing, and it's not a thing at all, actually. It's, a pro it's an approach to addressing creation, in a sense. It's an approach to studying the details in a way that, um, that helps others. So that it's a good thing, so that, so that you can actually think of working in STEM-related fields as a, a, as a calling, you know, as, as a ministry, as a way of using um, God's gifts to individuals who want to pursue those fields in a way that glorifies God. So it's not like you choose ministry or you choose something STEM-related that's unrelated, um, or you go into STEM just as a kind of a, like a tent-making thing, but you really have, you, 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 it's actually the work itself is, can be seen as something that is a ministry. Um, second, so encouraging people to go into these fields in the first place is, is I think, a real help. I think churches should have science fairs or, or you know, have fields, just showing kids that, that they, it's not about some kind of argument, that science should be something that's embraced, it's a natural part of, of, of loving God, and um, there doesn't need to be some kind of argument at the outset. I mean, there are some difficult questions that need to be grappled with. Secondly, I think um, keeping clear that the, the ways we understand science and the way we use it, that, that there's a broad spectrum of Christian thought. So people who love the Lord and, and are trying to use their lives in, in a way that's a faithful discipleship can sometimes have different opinions on how to interpret the Bible related to modern science or, or, or different understandings of how we should be using science and technology. And so, you know, th that's okay. By keeping kind of, by showing people that, that there's a breadth of approaches to these things that are faithful, that enables people to, or young people especially, to feel like I can go into this with an open mind and not feel like I'm constantly having to to struggle between science and my faith. Thirdly, I think once people are in the field or going into these fields, it's hard, you know, and it takes a long time, and there aren't always immediate obvious benefits to spending years studying some very tedious details of, that, that are in the weeds of science and engineering. So encouragement that this is a good thing to do and that your church is behind you and that we're interested in what you do, we want to hear from you, um, I think is helpful uh, and then fourth, helping these people find fellowship with other believers who are in, uh, in science fields. And one of the resources that I mentioned um, is the American Scientific Affiliation, which is right there, um, which is a network, uh, a national and even international network of Christians who are involved in science-related fields. Um, and it becomes a, a, a very nice connection. A lot of students get involved in this. So, so um, I, I think uh, those are some things that come to mind. Questions you might have, just raise your hand if you have a question for Dr. Actually, Weiser. I thought one more thing. Yes, go ahead. If you talk about, first of all, science is not irrelevant. There's another thing going on in churches that maybe science just is irrelevant. On Sundays, we talk about these things, and then on Mondays, we talk about those things. 
But there are ways of bringing science into the life of the church in a way that shows that it's relevant. I, I mentioned some things for young people, but I think there's some obvious ways of, sh as an astronomer, showing some of the beautiful imagery as a part of praise, you know, as a part of, of worship, as a part of uplifting the human spirit, and then some of the other technologies and things that are being used to serve others uh, um, can be brought into the life of, of even the Sunday morning worship. So go ahead. Yep. Very good. I think Kyle has a question here. Uh, I'm actually ex hoping you can expand on the last comment you made. Um, I, uh, I remember, I don't remember when, this was quite a while ago, uh, Lou Giglio put out a, a video um, about the universe. Um, and it was a, a worship video that engaged heavily with astronomy. And I was wondering if you could speak to how things like that, or, or maybe deeper than that, can be involved in our worship and in our worship services and lead us to and inspire us to worship God? Well, I think, um, and one thing I really like about what he has done is to bring some of the um, amazing discoveries from astronomy, but I think this can be true in, in many fields, biology, geology, whatever, that are going on in mainstream science, but bring them to the church in the context of humility, gratefulness, praise, and bring them accurately. So he, he did his homework. I mean, he went and actually visited space centers to learn about the details of some of these space telescope images before he started presenting them in youth groups. And so he, so learning, the, it doesn't do any good to to show science in a way that most scientists would think is inaccurate any any way that any more than you would want you know to herald brain surgery in a way that's inaccurate right <laughs> so so any kind of um you know bringing bringing things in in a way that's um that the scientific community might agree is 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 what you're actually seeing but in a context of praise and giving honor to God as the author of all things, I think is a wonderful way of bringing connections, especially so young people don't feel like they have to put one side of their brain over here and one side of their brain over there, and to kind of think, wow, this is all together. And for Christians to say, you know, God is in charge of all of this, and we can rejoice in all of this together, or we can grapple with difficult questions, all of this together together. Um, but um, it's relevant. My faith is relevant to what's going on in, in the rest of the world, discovery and discovery in the rest of the world, and science is relevant to faith. These things go together. I don't know if that gets to your question or not. Very good. Question up here. Pat. First off, I, I just want to thank you for... This is fascinating to me, so far outside of my area of expertise, yeah. but like you, I grew up on a farm looking up at the night sky mm -hmm. and just find all of this fascinating. I wanted to kind of ask about the dialogue aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, as uh, you mentioned, Doser and, and everything. So as theologians, mo I think mostly theologians, people in uh, practical ministry in this room, how do we engage in dialogue with scientists in the scientific fields? Uh, just what are some practical tips that you would have for us for engaging in that kind of dialogue? Um, I think, first of all, I forgot to say that on your tables, um, this is a, an image of a flaring star. And when you tilt it back and forth, you see how the light has moved out over time and lit up surrounding gas and dust around that star. It tells you about it on the back. So there should be enough for everyone to take one of these with you. And if you've run out of them on your table, go rob from another table, okay? So uh, that's my gift to you. Um, first of all, to have dialogue, you need to have contact, right? So uh, one of the things that this AAAS dialogue on science, ethics, and religion program, the Diet Dozer program, has done in some cities is to bring together for a day and a half of just facilitated dialogue science leaders from local research universities with faith leaders, local pastors, things like that, to spend 
time not trying to come to consensus on some particular issue, but actually just kind of hearing from each other what their interests are and what the, their, their immediate community interests are and, and what their concerns or perceptions are of each other. In fact, that whole project was called Perceptions. And a lot of times, these are in the same city, so people who are faith leaders in that city and people who are science uh, leaders in that city, and the scientists may or may not be people of faith. It, it wasn't, that wasn't the, relevant to this, these gatherings. Um, and they were all excited to come because they didn't have the architecture. They all knew that they really needed to have some kind of better interaction with these, the, this other culture in their same town, but they had no idea how to do that. And to find out that, hey, we actually, our kids go play on the same Little League teams, or you know, we, we shop in the same supermarket, and we have something in common. But to build an architecture means somebody has to step out and say, hey, we're, we're having this luncheon conversation or this coffee hour. Would you come, you know, maybe it's out of your comfort zone, but we really want you, let's say you're a, a pastor or a theologian, you contact the scientists in the local department and say, come and tell us a little bit about what you do, and we want to tell you why we're interested or vice versa, the scientists should be reaching out to local area communities. And I think some of the confusion is that the question is, are the, is the religious community trying to bring religion to the scientists, or, you know, um, and, or, or even try, or should scientists, you know, be trying to push something onto the religious community? Well, that's not what anybody wants, right, in these conversations. What scientists want and need to hear, I think, is what the interests are. And as you can see, what I just described, there's a huge amount of interest in how science and technology affect modern life. And churches and ministries care about the welfare of others and the welfare of the world. And so learning more about what we're learning in science, about ecology and about genetics and about the brain, is very relevant to a life of ministry. And scientists need to hear that. Um, religious communities need to understand what scientists care about. Scientists actually care about the ethics of what they're doing, the motivations of why they're doing it, what's needed out in the community. They need to hear that from people who are more in touch elbow to elbow with uh, people of all kinds in the community. So hearing from each other what the needs and interests, overlapping needs and interests are is important, and to hear from each other, there needs to be contact. To be contacted, to make contact Somebody has to step out and create an architecture or a way for there being communication. And I think person-to-person -person is much more effective than just um, impersonal written articles and things. As, as, as useful as those are, meeting one another is the most important thing. And, and these are overlapping groups, right? There are scientists who, who are people of devout faith. Um, and so these are overlapping communities. So.